This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening everyone. Welcome. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin tonight, I would like to um, introduce Stevie Goldsmith, who is going to present the Welcome to Country. Thank you. Story. Greetings, everybody. Uh, it's the language of this country here, and I've welcomed you all here to this place we now call Adelaide. <laughs> but uh, for us, as, 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 as Ghana people, as Aboriginal people of this uh, great continent that we now call Australia, we, we sit on the nation of the land of the, the Ghana nation, and we call this, we know this place as Tananyanga the story place of the big red kangaroo, a very significant place for, for Ghana, a very significant place for all Aboriginal people. And it gives me a great welcome to, to welcome you all here, to acknowledge uh, we sit on Ghana land, but more particular to, to welcome our, our, our brother, our Yunga, uh, uh, the Wiradjuri uh, Gamilaroi man here, to come here to visit us on, the, on our country here. We have a word in this country called Bamba Mandalia. It's probably the longest word we have, and it's very hard to say. But I hope you take that the, uh, the time to learn uh, some of the language, particularly the language that, uh, of the land upon which you, you live, that you frequent. Uh, it gives you a bit more insight into uh, uh, the nature of the, the country, but also the nature of the people, and the insight into the true cultural uh, heritage of all Australian people living on Aboriginal land. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome uh, Mr. Stan Grant here today to, to talk about his book, Talking to My Country, and uh, give us a, a great insight into his views on, on the, his story as a Wiradjuri man, as a Gibraltar man, but also uh, as an Australian, how he sees Australia. And uh, I guess everyone here, by well, the numbers here, we all know Stan uh, over many years. We've seen him develop as a as a young reporter to to. Uh, um, to a great journalist now, and uh, we all, whenever I see Stan, I always listen with intent because I know Stan is uh, one of the very few people that I, that I trust to talk on, on Aboriginal issues because he's, he's done the hard yards and uh, he knows the right questions to ask. He does his research so well. I'm very, uh, very uh, uh, welcome. I'm very I look forward to, to hearing his story about talking to his country and what that entails and look forward to reading his book and I hope you all get a copy out there and I believe he's going to sign it for you as well. So uh, I think he's going to end up with a bit of writer's cramp today. Uh, tonight, but uh, and I'm also, uh, of course, we're all aware that he's uh, been appointed now to, uh, to the government as the the advisor on the, the recognition campaign. So I very well uh, much look forward to his views on the, on the recon recognition campaign and uh, an insight and in what it means for for Stan, what it means for for Aboriginal people, what it means for Australia as a whole. So everybody, welcome here to the Stan Grant uh, story about talking to his country and to brother Stan. Welcome to Ghana country. Great to have you. Here. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Stevie. So I would like to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to Stan Grant's presentation on his new book, Talking to My Country. I warmly welcome Stan and I'm thrilled that he's been able to take time out of his extremely busy schedule, so thank you. We are also very pleased to be co-presenting this event with Matilda Bookshop and I would like to thank Gavin Williams for his support for this event tonight as well and his team. Um, as we know, Gavin will be selling uh, Stan's book at the end of the lecture and yes, Stan will be there to sign them for you. The Hawke Centre is committed to delivering a diverse and free program of events and exhibitions throughout the year which reflect our fundamental themes of strengthening our democracy, building our future, and valuing our diversity. As the session tonight is being recorded, um, can I please ask that you switch your phones to silent, but please feel free to join the Twitter conversation using the links shown on the screen. I would also like to acknowledge the following guests. Professor Peter Buckskin, Dean of Indigenous Scholarship, Engagement and Research at the University of South Australia. Cheryl Axelby, CEO of the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement, Incorporated. Mark Waters, State Manager of Reconciliation SA. And of course, Stevie Goldsmith, our Ghana elder. So just to give you a quick introduction, um, Stan Grant is a Wiradjuri man from Western New South Wales to the city streets of New York, London, Paris, Rome, Shanghai, via Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iraq. Stan has certainly lived his life on the road. Through education and tenacity, Stan has carved out a career as one of this country's leading journalists. He has been a political correspondent for the ABC, a news and current affairs anchor for the Seven Network and SBS, and for more than a decade, he was a foreign correspondent for CNN, based in Asia and the Middle East. His reporting from war zones, the closed worlds of Myanmar and North Korea, tsunami ravaged Sri Lanka, and the booming new China has won him some of the world's most pre prestigious journalism awards. Now he is back home with us, tackling the stories closest to him. He is the international editor for Sky News, managing editor of National Indigenous Television, and Indigenous Affairs editor at The Guardian. And just last week, Stan was appointed by Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull to the Referendum Council on Constitutional Recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Please, a very warm welcome. Stan Grant. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you as well to, uh, to Stevie for that fantastic welcome to country. And from my people, the Wiradjuri and Gummeroy people of New South Wales, I bring greetings as well. It's been an extraordinary year, hasn't it? A year when we have focused on who we are as a country, where I found myself, and I have to admit completely unexpectedly, at the centre of this extraordinary conversation, this extraordinary discussion about who we are as Australians, what we want this country to be, and how we need to face and reconcile the darkness of our past. There is a quote I want to start with tonight from a French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, and he said, we must remember because remembering is a moral duty. We owe a debt to the victims. By remembering and telling, we prevent forgetfulness from killing the victims twice. So much of our history in Australia has been forgotten, so much of our history has not been told. So much of the book that I have written is an attempt to try to connect everyone in Australia to the personal stories of us, the story of what it is to be an Indigenous person in Australia. A Baradjuri Gamalroy man in my case, but 
My experience and my family's experience speaks as well to the experience of all indigenous people in this country. There is nothing unfamiliar in my family's experience Nothing that other indigenous people in Australia would not also recognize in their own families. The story of dispossession, the story of marginalization, the story of being forced onto missions and reserves, the stories of exclusion, the stories of brutality, the story of being locked out of this country's economy, locked out of the progress of Australia, a story that revealed itself to me just last year in the most stark terms. As we heard tonight, I'd spent so much of my life, half of my working life, living outside of Australia, traveling the world, covering the great stories of our times. I was in Northern Ireland covering the troubles, hundreds of years of sectarian violence, Catholic and Protestant pitted against each other. I'd reported in North Korea, a country carved out at the height of the Cold War, a line drawn between a people, the North on one side and the South on the other. I'd reported from China, a country forged out of a hundred years of humiliation. That's the phrase they use, a hundred years of humiliation at the hands of foreign powers. I reported from the Middle East a country carved up and divided by outsiders, artificial borders, people grouped together against religion, against ethnicity, against their family and tribal connections. And now we're seeing the explosion of the Middle East as people rise up against these artificial boundaries and assert new identities. These were the stories that I told as a reporter. The stories of a world in flux, a world undergoing enormous change. It is often said of a correspondent that we get to write the first draft of history. And so it has been true in my life. But in talking about these stories, in meeting these people, I also met myself. In sitting down with a refugee in a, in a camp in Afghanistan or Pakistan, I looked into their eyes and I saw the eyes of my family. I saw the eyes of my people. People also moved off their land, forced into camps. People who where hope and certainty had been removed. And people trying to live lives of dignity and meaning against all of that uncertainty. When I met a Chinese peasant farmer looking for his foothold into the China dream, I saw my father, a sawmiller, moving from town to town in rural New South Wales, trying to put food on the table, trying to find shelter for his family, and looking for a way also into the Australian dream. These were lives formed by the big forces of history. And I realized too that my life was forged by the same forces of history. And I came back to Australia fighting old battles, fighting old battles that came out of this history. A country still divided, still unable to reconcile and find a bridge across that chasm of our history. And last year, it revealed itself, and it revealed itself in that place that is most sacred to us as Australians. The place where we imagine that we find ourselves at our best, a place that we imagine is a place of equality, a place where your endeavours and your talent will determine your destiny, not the colour of your skin. It happened on the sporting field. Suddenly, a story that was remote and distant was not remote and distant anymore. Suddenly this story was in the grandstands, was on the hills, was no longer on the front pages of the newspaper, it was on the back page too. It was in the playgrounds. People were talking about it in their homes. And I'm talking of course about the booing of Adam Goods. 
This was not a, this was not something that was just about sport. This was not something about the tribalism of sporting loyalty or the fervor of football fanaticism. This was something much deeper. This came from our history. When a 13 year old girl called Adam Goods an ape, we know where that came from. A girl who would not have even known herself the full extent, the full impact of what she was saying, but formed in her imagination was the image of an indigenous man as an ape. That comes from the darkness of our history. That comes from terra nullius. That comes from the idea that Aboriginal people were not human and had no rights and no legal standing in their land. That comes from the fact that when Europeans first came to this land, they didn't look upon us as a people with 60,000 years of tradition and law and music and art and politics of people who lived and loved a people who had made the first open sea journey in the history of mankind, who had found a home in this continent before this continent had even been formed. A people who developed a language and a culture and a relationship to this country as the volcanoes shaped the landscape, as the seas rose and cut off New Guinea and Tasmania from the mainland. As this country took shape, we took shape too. But none of that, none of that was acknowledged. Instead, this was an empty land, a land to be claimed and tamed. And the people themselves seen as barely human, and if we were human at all, we occupied the lowest rung on civilization's ladder. You can draw a line from there to a 13-year-old girl calling Adam Goods an ape. That is embedded in the Australian imagination so deeply we can't even see it or recognize it. But we are formed out of that. In 1788, at the time of settlement, the idea that all humans are equal, was alive in the world. That immortal declaration had already been penned more than a decade earlier. The Declaration of Independence in the United States, a country itself grappling with holding people in bondage, grappling with the stain of slavery, but a country that could still aspire to the fundamental equality of all people. The idea that colonized people, people whose lands had been taken, people who had been subjugated, people who had been declared subjects of the crown, these people too had had their rights acknowledged. There were treaties written with other peoples, other indigenous peoples in the world, but not us. When I spoke earlier this year of racism destroying the Australian dream. This is what I was talking about. Not a current idea of who we are as a people in 2016. That's part of it. But the idea that Australia itself is born out of a fundamental racist notion that we are people with all of those centuries of of tradition and law and occupation of this land had no fundamental right to it. And we know that that led to the poisoning of water holes, that led to the rounding up of people and forcing them on, off their lands and onto reserves and missions. We know that led to taking children away no, that led to the idea that we would vanish as a race of people. The generations of suffering 
at injustice that Indigenous people have endured in Australia comes from that first act of dispossession or theft or settlement or invasion or whatever the different names that we like to give it, whatever titles we like to use, whatever phrases we deem appropriate, the outcome is inarguable. It is there today still in the reality of Indigenous people's lives. It is connected to the act of taking people's land and denying them their rights. By 1901, as this country was being federated, as it was coming into being as a modern nation, the idea persisted that we had no place. It would be unthinkable today, wouldn't it, to imagine if we were drawing up the Constitution in 2016 as we are and as we find ourselves today, unthinkable that Indigenous people would not have some contribution to make some role in shaping the Constitution of this country. But in 1901, that was far from the case. In 1901, Alfred Deakin, the second Prime Minister of Australia, could foresee a time when we would no longer exist. As he'd said, th as he'd said then, a hundred years ago, Australia was a dark continent with no white people upon it. A hundred years hence, he believed there would be no dark people left. But we endured. Here we were being written out of Australia, the dying pillow being smoothed, but we endured. We didn't disappear. We found ourselves, we found ourselves on these missions. We found ourselves on these reserves. We rallied against the forces that were arrayed against us. This is the history that has shaped me. This is the history that has shaped all of us in this country and the history that we've been denied. In 1963, when I was born, I was born into what the anthropologist W.E.H. Stano described as the great Australian silence. As he said, a cult of forgetfulness practiced on a national scale. When I went to school, Captain Cook discovered Australia. Lawson, Blacksland and Wentworth crossed the Blue Mountains and opened up the Australian interior. And my people vanished. I would go to school as a young boy and I would recite the pledge, the oath. I salute the flag, I honour my God, I serve the Queen. And then I would go home at night to where that flag had deposited us, on the margins of Australia, on the outside looking in. It wasn't poverty alone that marked us, it was something else. It was the fact that we were Aboriginal people. When I was born in 1963, I was born into a Wiradjuri and Gummeroy family. My father, a Wiradjuri man, my mother, a Gummeroy woman. Two people who had been forged out of the furnace of bigotry and poverty. Two people clinging to each other and trying to find a way to survive. I was born into a deep history, a history that connected me to people who had forged their lives out of this continent. My people, the Wiradjuri people, fought a war with the settlers in Bathurst in the 1820s. I know we like to argue and debate the use of these phrases still. Was it a war? Was it a conflict? What do we call it? Well, at the time, they had no doubt about what to call it. At the time, the Sydney Gazette, reporting that conflict as surely as I reported the conflicts of Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and Pakistan, 
described it as a war of extermination. Martial law was declared against the Wiradjuri people. My people could be shot with impunity. For years, we fought the settlers around Bathurst until Windradine, the Wiradjuri leader, led the huddled remnants of our people on a trek over the Blue Mountains into Parramatta, where he sat with the governor of the time and negotiated a settlement. Windradine, this man who had led his people to fight bravely for their country, wore a straw hat and written on the, word, on, on the brim of the hat was the word peace and in a language he had never heard as a boy, the English language, he sat down and negotiated a settlement. Rations and blankets were handed out to the Wiradjuri people. The names were recorded but in the recording of the names that were given rations that day were the names of my family. The name Grant appears in those ration books. We were the families that were born out of the frontier conflict. In 1940, a man named Budyan spoke his language to his grandson in the streets of Griffith in New South Wales. He was arrested and he was taken to jail. Budjan was also known as Wilfred Johnson. He was my great grandfather. The boy that he spoke to that day was my father. They were living with the weight of this country's history. In the 1870s, a young girl was hiding on a mission called Warren Gesda on the banks of the Murrumbidgee River. All the young girls were being rounded up and taken to a dormitory where they would be trained to become domestic servants taken from their families. She was discovered hiding in one of the huts. She was forced into the dormitory and for good measure as a punishment, she was starved, her food rations halved. Her name was Lydia Naden, and she was my great-great-grandmother. Lydia grew up to marry a man who, as a boy, was taken from his family on the south coast of New South Wales. He was taken to another mission settlement at Malaga on the banks of the Murray River, before ultimately, too, being taken to Warren Gesda. Frank Foster grew up a man who bristled at authority, who challenged authority, who would not accept his place on the mission. Ultimately, he was banished. And he appears regularly in the, in the records of the Aborigines, the protector of Aborigines, appearing in different missions and settlements across New South Wales until he too died finding his way back home to the south coast. Frank Foster was living with the weight of this country's history. Frank and Lydia had a daughter. She was my great-grandmother. In 1912, a young girl was taken from her family at Cowra in New South Wales. The mission manager had signed her over to the welfare authorities to be taken to a girl's home at Cootamundra. There, she lost her name. She was given a number, number 658. She was held in this girl's home at Cootamundra where the girls would be marched into town wearing white gloves, taken to school and brought straight back home again separated from their families, separated from other Aboriginal people. She would sleep in a dormitory with a sign on the wall, act white, think white, be white. This girl was eventually sent to work for white 
squatter families in western New South Wales. Eventually she found her way back to her family where she had to apply for permission to live on the Aboriginal reserve next to her brother. She then had to apply for permission to marry the man she loved. This girl, number 658, died at the age of 37 from complications of rheumatic fever that she had contracted while living in that girl's home. She left behind six orphan children to be separated and farmed out to other families, another family torn apart and lost. Number 658 had a name and her name was Eunice Grant. And she was my great aunt, she was the sister of my grand grandfather. When I was born in 1963, the great Australian silence had written these people out of our history. I didn't learn of the deeds of Windradine at my school. There was no pride in the telling of Aboriginal resistance. I didn't learn of children taken away. I didn't learn about families controlled by the state. I was told to salute the flag, honour my God and serve my Queen. In 1963, when I was born, the dispossession was continuing. In 1963, police came under cover of darkness to an Aboriginal settlement in Queensland, a place called Mapoon. And they forced all of the local residents from their homes and burned the homes to the ground. The land was being handed over to a bauxite mining company. Those people today still remember that as the night of the burning. That was 1963. That was in my lifetime. The dispossession didn't end in 1788. People like to imagine that we should get past this, we should get over this, that this is all something that happened long ago. But it didn't happen long ago. It lives in our memories. It shapes our families. It connects us to who we are. In the same way that people live with the spectre of the Cold War still in North Korea. In the same way that the people of Afghanistan live with the waves of invasion and battles that have been fought in their country for hundreds of years. In the same way that the people of Iraq live with the memory of the tyranny of Saddam Hussein and the war that followed and now the ravages of Islamic State. In the same way that people all over the world are shaped by their history, so too are we. And in the same way that we respect the histories of those countries and we see the humanity of the people who have endured those histories, so too we need to see the humanity of us and how we have struggled to endure in this country. But if that, all, if that is all there was to this story, There'd be little point in you reading my book. There'd be little point in me being here tonight to talk to you. If all it was was the story of grievance and loss and tragedy and suffering, if all it was was what white Australia had done to us, then there'd be little point in us coming together tonight to even have this conversation. But that's not all. It is. When I gave my speech in the racism debate, many people saw, heard the words that I'd spoken in defiance of the Australian dream. They heard the pain and the hurt that my family had endured. But not a lot of people heard the rest of that speech. For while it is true that we need to remember that we need to tell these stories as the great French philosopher said, 
to ensure that we do not kill the victims twice, it is also important that we do not remain bound by that history, that we do not remain trapped in that history. The other part of the speech that I gave spoke to the greatness of Australia. The final words of that speech were that we are better than this. Yes, we have fought great battles in this country. Yes, my people have suffered greatly in this country. But we are better than this. We are not Syria. We are not Iraq. We are not Pakistan. We are not Afghanistan. We are not North Korea. Years spent reporting the horror of the world, standing in the blood of suicide bombings, seeing people's lives torn apart by hatred and conflict, people who take power at the barrel of a gun, people who would kill you for your religion, years of sitting across the table from people who would just as soon slice my throat open out of a sheer hatred for everything that I represent as an infidel, told me that we are better than this. A country is demonstrably successful, a country that is as prosperous and tolerant and cohesive as Australia is better than this. I can look out here tonight and I can see the faces in front of me and I can see people from all countries. I can see people who've come to this country to make a new life because they cling to the hope of what Australia can represent. We are, in the eyes of so many in the world, the envy of the world. And I choose to believe in that. I could resort to anger. There is anger in me, there is anger in every single indigenous person I know. But we know that that is not the story of us. We are not a people who have turned other people away. Despite everything that's been done to us, you go to an Aboriginal family, you go to an Aboriginal community, and you will find love and welcome and acceptance. We are a people who signed up to fight wars for this country as my grandfather did when he was not yet even recognized as a citizen because he believed in something better. We are a people who have held out the hand of friendship to people who otherwise would have rejected us because we believe Australia is better. And I've met non-Indigenous Australians who have shown me that that belief in their goodness is not in vain, it is not futile, that people want something better in this country. These are the people who marched across bridges for reconciliation. These are the people who stood with us and shed tears with us when Kevin Rudd delivered the apology to the stolen generations. These are the people who 50 years ago, in 1967, said no indigenous people deserve the fullness of citizenship of this country, deserve to be counted in the census as part of the population of this country, deserve to be recognized as human beings. The single greatest carriage of a referendum in our country's history. Those people were better than this. I choose to believe Australia is not bound and chained to the darkness of its past. And I say this fully aware that we suffer enormously still in Australia, that we die 10 years younger than the rest of the country, that we are fewer than 3% of the population and more than a quarter of the prison populations. We know the statistics. We are three times more likely to suffer depression, that children under the age of 14 are nine times more likely to commit suicide. We live with the reality of this. We live with constant grieving. We live with constant mourning in our lives. I know that, but I choose to believe that tomorrow will be better. I choose to believe in the words of Martin Luther King when he said that the, the arc of history bends towards justice. 
because our people have clung to that hope. We have clung to the hope of justice. It was there in the day of mourning in the 1930s when we stood up and demanded our citizenship. It was there when Charles Perkins went out to desegregate and open up the schools and the swimming pools and the hospitals of a segregated outback New South Wales in the 1960s. It was there in the fight for the 67 referendum. It was there in Paul Keating's speech in 1992 when he spoke about the history of this country. It was there in the apology, it is there in our forgiveness that we too believe in something better. The people who stood up last year at the height of the booing of Adam Goods and said, no, that is not us. The people who stood with him, not against him, who stood with us and listened to us, they know that is not what this country is about. Now I know there are many of my own people who maybe take a different view and I fully understand it. Some of my own people who reject Australia, who don't even want to acknowledge the fact that they are part of this country, who reject the Constitution, who have never ceded their sovereignty, who will never subject themselves to Australia, that they believe inherently in their rights as Aboriginal people to determine their own destiny, and I fully understand that. But I also know from the years of reporting the years of seeing people torn apart by conflict and politics, I also know that there is no future in isolation. The world is changing. We live in a globalised world, a world connected in ways we could not have imagined even 20 years ago. We live in a world where I could sit with a Chinese peasant farmer on the mountains of Guizhou who can do business on the internet with someone in Shanghai. We live in a connected world. For the first time in human history, more people live in cities than live in the countryside. We are coming together, we are drawn together, whether we are ready for it or whether we choose it or not, there is no place for us on the margins of Australia, let alone locked out of the rest of the world. The challenge for us now, my people, is to find a way to express ourselves, to find our place in Australia. It is not a place that will be defined by assimilation or even integration. It is a place where our rights are fundamentally respected, where we are recognised for who we are, where the antiquity and the depth of our culture are enshrined and recognised in this country where we can engage meaningfully as indigenous people with the mainstream social, economic and political life of this country. And we are already doing it. My people who I see here tonight are already doing this. They're living next to you in the suburbs. Their children are going to school with your children. We're sitting next to each other in the grandstands at the football. We are already doing it. In the next year perhaps Australia will be asked again to decide what sort of country are we going to be. Potentially we will go to a referendum to recognise Indigenous people in the Constitution. We'll be asked again to look at ourselves and look at our history. That we will emerge from the great Australian silence to understand who we are and what we want to be as a people today. I think for many people, they would be unaware of what the role of the Constitution plays in our lives. Many people would not have read the Constitution. To many people, it's, a, it's something distant from their lives. But as Aboriginal people, we know how that can determine our lives. We know the fact that we were not recognised in 1901, that we were seen as a vanishing race, determined our fate. We know that there were clauses in the Constitution, race clauses, that allowed for our children to be taken, that told us who we could marry and where we could live. We know that in 1967, a job was half done. But there still remains the task of fulfilling the promise of 1967 of being able to acknowledge the past, to redress the imbalances of the past, to be able to take 
the racial clauses out of our constitution and to frame indigenous people at the center of Australian life. But as there are challenges for my people, and as we are going to struggle with the idea of what recognition may or may not mean, some of us will reject it, some of us will embrace it, others will want more, others will call for a treaty, and these are discussions that we need to have. As these are discussions that we will have, you too, non-Indigenous people will have your own conversations about this, and you too are going to have to ask what it is that you want Australia to represent. What, it is the, what role do you believe Indigenous people should have in Australia? Because without you, we know there is no future for us. 3% of the population, we can't determine the governments of this country. You, the 97%, will determine who, who governs Australia and whether those people will govern in our best interests. How do we redress that imbalance? How do non-Indigenous people themselves open up to the antiquity of this country? to accept the depths of Aboriginal occupation in Australia, not just as ours, but as yours too. That what has happened on this country to my people has happened on this country to your people. I've been reading a book over the past week called In Praise of Forgetting by an author named David Reef. It's a challenging book. It's a book that has challenged the way that I see the world the way that I see myself, the way that I see my country and our history. It says in order to reconcile, maybe there are some things we need to forget. I don't know that he's right in saying we need to forget, but there are certainly some things we need to move beyond. What my people have suffered and endured has made me who I am, it has put me here today. But I know that my life will be determined by my future, that my children's lives will be determined by their futures and not by their past. Identity that is framed around grievance and opposition and isolation cannot endure. That our identities need to be framed around our ability to, to survive, our ability to succeed, and our ability to find in each other a common destination for all of us. Two years ago, I stood with my father at Charles Sturt University in Wagga. My father, who was a little boy, had seen his grandfather arrested for speaking his language. My father had spent his life working in the sawmills of New South Wales. He'd lost the tips of three of his fingers. He'd felt the brutality of the police. He'd been locked up. He'd been beaten up. He had hard, lived a hard, scrabble life just to put food on our table. Later in his life, my father got the opportunity to work with a man to restore the Wiradjuri language. He helped write the first Wiradjuri dictionary. He spoke Wiradjuri in the prisons and the schools and on the riverbanks. Wherever he could speak it to people, he spoke it. He taught people how to teach the language. He rejuvenated a language that his father, that his grandfather had been jailed for speaking. Two years ago, I stood with my father as he was awarded a Doctor of Letters for his work in saving his language. He spoke his language on that stage that day. Baludu Wiradjuri Gibia, I am a Wiradjuri man. He spoke the language his grandfather had been jailed for speaking. On that day, when I, I saw the journey of Australia. I saw that we are not a people trapped in our past. 
I saw that we are not a people who need to be divided by our history. I saw that despite all that has happened, we can triumph, that Australia is better than that. Thank you.